talk about Snape. What did you do? You saw it. Everyone saw it. I snapped my fingers. Harry, stop teasing me. So, he'd been promoted to Harry now. Interesting. And in fact, Harry was fairly sure that he was meant to notice that and feel bad if he didn't respond somehow. All right then. I deduced one of Severus's secrets and did a bit of blackmail. Good. Now tell me something you didn't tell in strict confidence to the idiots in Gryffindor, meaning that was the story you wanted to get all over the school. Harry grinned involuntarily, and he knew that Draco had caught it. What is Severus saying? That he hadn't realized how sensitive the feelings of young children were, even in Slytherin, even to me. Are you sure that you want to know something your head of house would rather you not know? Yes. Then you really are going to send your minions away first, because I'm not sure I can believe everything you believe about them. Okay. Boss. You've given Mr. Potter no reason to trust you. Go. They left. Anyway, trade. I tell you a fact that isn't on the grapevine, and does not go on the grapevine, and in particular does not go to your father, and in return you tell me what you and Slytherin think about the whole business. Deal. Now, to make this as vague as possible, something that wouldn't hurt much even if it did get out. What I said was true. I did discover one of Severus's secrets, and I did do some blackmail. But Severus wasn't the only person involved. I knew it! Harry's stomach sank. He had apparently said something very significant, and he did not know why. This was not a good sign. Alright, so here's what the reaction was like in Slytherin. First, all the idiots were like, We hate Harry Potter! Let's go beat him up! What is wrong with the sorting hat? That's not Slytherin, it's Gryffindor! Not all children are prodigies. And it took around 15 seconds for someone to explain to them why this might not be such a favor to Snape. So you're fine. And then the actual smart people started talking. It's obvious that you found a way to put a lot of pressure on Snape. And while that could be more than one thing, the obvious next thought is that it has something to do with Snape's unknown hold over Dumbledore. How Slytherin had wondered why Severus wasn't getting fired, and they'd concluded that Severus was blackmailing Dumbledore. Could that actually be true? But Dumbledore hadn't seemed to act like it. And the next thing the smart people pointed out was that if you could put enough pressure on Snape to make him leave half of Hogwarts alone, that meant you probably had enough power to get rid of him entirely if you wanted. What you did to him was a humiliation, just the same way he tried to humiliate you, but you left us our head of house. But it would be a very stupid thing to leave an enemy around like that. If you could break his hold over Dumbledore, the obvious thing would be to just do it. Dumbledore would kick Snape out of Hogwarts and maybe even have him killed, and he'd be very grateful to you, and you wouldn't have to worry about Snape sneaking into your dorm room at night with interesting potions. Harry's face was now neutral. He had not thought of that, and he really, really should have. And from this you concluded... Snape's hold was some secret of Dumbledore's, and you've got the secret. It can't be powerful enough to destroy Dumbledore entirely, or Snape would have used it by now. So it must have limits. But it's got to be really good. Father's been trying to get Snape to tell him for years. And now Lucius thinks maybe I can tell him. Did you already get an owl? I will tonight. It will say... His voice took on a different, more formal cadence. My beloved son, I've already told you of Harry Potter's potential importance. As you have already realized, his importance has now become greater and more urgent. If you see any possible avenue of friendship or point of pressure with him, you must pursue it, and the full resources of Malfoy are at your disposal if needed. Well, not commenting on whether or not your whole complicated edifice of theory is true, let me just say that we are not quite such good friends as yet. I know. Has it occurred to you that if you know something Dumbledore doesn't want known, Dumbledore might simply have you killed, and it would turn the boy who lived from a potential competing leader into a valuable martyr, too. No comment. He hadn't thought of that last part, either. Didn't seem to be Dumbledore style, but... Harry, you've obviously got incredible talent, but you've got no training and no mentors, and you do stupid things sometimes. 
And you really need an advisor who knows how to do this, or you're going to get hurt. Ah, an advisor like Lucius? Like me! I'll promise to keep your secrets from father, from everyone. I'll just help you figure out whatever you want to do. Wow. Harry saw that Zombie Quirrell was staggering in through the doors. Class is about to start. I'll think about what you said. There's lots of times I do wish I had all your training. It's just I don't know how I can trust you so quickly. You shouldn't. It's too soon. See? I'll give you good advice even if it hurts me. But we should maybe hurry up and become closer friends. I'm open to that. Another bit of advice. Right now, everyone in Slytherin is wondering about you, so if you're courting us, which I think you are, you should do something that signals friendship with Slytherin. Soon, like today or tomorrow. It's got to be something obvious. Push your mudblood rival Granger into a wall or something. Everyone in Slytherin will know what that means. Today, I had planned to teach you your first defensive spell, a small shield that was the ancestor of today's Protego. But on second thought, I have changed today's lesson plan in light of recent events. Draco, of the noble and most ancient house of Malfoy. Is it your ambition to become the next Dark Lord? That's an odd question, Professor. I mean, who'd be dumb enough to admit it? Indeed. So while there is no point in asking any of you, it would not surprise me in the slightest if there were a student or two in my classes who harbored ambitions of being the next Dark Lord. After all, I wanted to be the next Dark Lord when I was a young Slytherin. I didn't realize until later that what I really enjoyed was battle magic, and that my true ambition was to become a great fighting wizard and someday teach at Hogwarts. In any case, when I was 13 years old, I read through the historical sections of the Hogwarts Library, scrutinizing the lives and fates of past Dark Lords, and I made a list of all the mistakes that I would never make when I was a Dark Lord. So, Mr. Potter, can you guess what was the very first item on that list? Um, never use a complicated way of dealing with an enemy when you can just abracadabra them. The term, Mr. Potter, is Avada Kedavra. And no, that was not on the list I made at age 13. Would you care to guess again? Uh, never brag to anyone about your evil master plan. Ah, now that was number two. My, Mr. Potter, have we been reading the same books? But no. The first item was, I will not go around provoking strong, vicious enemies. The history of the world would be very different if more in life Falconsbane or Hitler had grasped that elementary point. Now if, Mr. Potter, just if, by some chance, you harbor an ambition similar to the one I held as a young Slytherin, even so, I hope it is not your ambition to become a stupid Dark Lord. Professor Quirrell! I am a Ravenclaw, and it is not my ambition to be stupid, period. I know that what I did today was dumb, but it wasn't dark. I was not the one who threw the first punch in that fight. You, Mr. Potter, are an idiot. But so was I at your age. Thus, I anticipated your answer and altered today's lesson plan accordingly. Mr. Gregory Goyle, if you would come forward, please. There was a surprised pause in the classroom. Harry hadn't been expecting that. Neither, from the looks of it, had Mr. Goyle. Most wizards do not bother much with what a muggle would term martial arts. Is not a wand stronger than a fist? This attitude is stupid. Wands are held in fists. If you want to be a great fighting wizard, you must learn martial arts to a level which would impress even a muggle. I will now demonstrate a certain vitally important technique which I learned in a dojo, a muggle school of martial arts, of which I shall speak more shortly. Mr. Goyle, I will ask you to attack me. Professor Quirrell, can I ask what level? Sixth Dawn. You will not be hurt, and neither will I. And if you see an opening, please take it. Mr. Goyle nodded, looking much relieved. Note that Mr. Goyle was afraid to attack someone who did not know martial arts to an acceptable level, for fear that I, or he, would be hurt. Mr. Goyle's attitude is exactly correct, and he has earned three Quirrell points for it. Now... Fight. Stop. You win. There was a silence in the classroom, a silence born of total confusion. Mr. Goyle, what vitally important technique did I demonstrate? How to fall correctly when someone throws you. It's one of the very first lessons you learn. That too. There was a pause. 
The vitally important technique which I demonstrated was how to lose. You may go, Mr. Goyle. Thank you. Mr. Goyle walked off the platform looking rather bewildered. Harry felt the same way. Sometimes we forget the most basic things, since it has been too long since we learned them. I realized I had done the same with my own lesson plan. You do not teach students to throw until you have taught them to fall. And I must not teach you to fight if you do not know how to lose. I learned how to lose in a dojo in Asia, which, as any muggle knows, is where all the good martial artists live. This dojo taught a style which had a reputation among fighting wizards as adapting well to magical dueling. The master of that dojo, an old man by muggle standards, was that style's greatest living teacher. He had no idea that magic existed, of course. I applied to study there and was one of the few students accepted that year from among many contenders. There might have been a tiny bit of special influence involved. During one of my first fights, after I had been beaten in a particularly humiliating fashion, I lost control and attacked my sparring partner. Thankfully with my fists rather than my magic. The master, surprisingly, did not expel me on the spot, but he told me that there was a flaw in my temperament. He explained it to me and I knew he was right. And then he said that I would learn how to lose. Upon his strict orders, all of the students in the dojo lined up. One by one, they approached me. I was not to defend myself. I was only to beg for mercy. One by one, they slapped me, or punched me, or pushed me to the ground. Some of them spat on me. They called me awful names in their language. And to each one, I had to say, I lose, and similar such things, such as, I beg you to stop, and, I admit you're better than me. I was a prodigy of battle magic even then. With wandless magic alone, I could have killed everyone in that dojo. I did not do so. I learned to lose. To this day, I remember it as one of the most unpleasant hours of my life. And when I left that dojo eight months later, which was not nearly enough time, but was all I could afford to spend, the master told me that he hoped I understood why that had been necessary. And I told him that it was one of the most valuable lessons I had ever learned. Which was, and is, true. You are wondering where this marvelous dojo is and whether you can study there. You cannot. For not long afterward, another would-be student came to that hidden place, to that remote mountain. The Dark Lord came to that school openly, without disguise, glowing red eyes and all. The students tried to bar his way and he simply apparated through. There was terror there, but discipline, and the master came forth. And the Dark Lord demanded, not asked, but demanded, to be taught. Perhaps the master had read too many books telling the lie that a true martial artist could defeat even demons. For whatever reason, the master refused. The Dark Lord asked why he could not be a student. The master told him he had no patience, and that was when the Dark Lord ripped his tongue out. You can guess what happened next. The students tried to rush the Dark Lord and fell over, stunned where they stood. And then... Professor Krull's voice faltered for a moment, then resumed. There is an unforgivable curse, the Cruciatus Curse, which produces unbearable pain. If the Cruciatus is extended for longer than a few minutes, it produces permanent insanity. One by one, the Dark Lord Crucio to the Master's students into insanity, and then finished them off with the killing curse, while the Master was forced to watch. When all his students had died in this way, the Master followed. I learned this from the single surviving student whom the Dark Lord had left alive to tell the tale, and who had been a friend of mine. The Dark Lord was foolish to wish that story retold. It did not show his strength, but rather an exploitable weakness. Dark wizards cannot keep their tempers. It is a nearly universal flaw of the species, and anyone who makes a habit of fighting them soon learns to rely on it. Understand that the Dark Lord did not win that day. His goal was to learn martial arts and yet he left without a single lesson. What precisely did you do wrong today, Mr. Potter? I lost my temper. That is not precise. I will describe it more exactly. There are many animals which have what are called dominance contests. They fight with their paws, with claws sheathed. But why with their claws sheathed? Surely, if they used their claws, they would stand a better chance of winning? But then their enemy might unsheath their claws as well, and instead of resolving the dominance contest with a winner and a loser, both of them might be severely hurt. When a Hogwarts professor challenged you, you did not back down. 
When it looked like you might lose, you unsheathed your claws, heedless of the danger. You escalated, and then you escalated again. It started with a slap at you from Professor Snape, who was obviously dominant over you. Instead of losing, you slapped back and lost ten points from Ravenclaw. Soon, you were talking about leaving Hogwarts. The fact that you escalated even further in some unknown direction, and somehow won at the end, does not change the fact that you are an idiot. That had been precise. Frighteningly precise. Now that Professor Quirrell had said it, Harry could see in hindsight that it was an exactly accurate description of what had happened. When someone's model of you was that good, you had to wonder whether they were right about other things too, like your intent to kill. The next time, Mr. Potter, that you choose to escalate a contest rather than lose, you may lose all the stakes you place on the table. I cannot guess what they were today. I can guess that they were far, far too high for the loss of ten house points. You will protest that you are trying to help all of Hogwarts, a much more important goal worthy of great risks. That is a lie. If you had been, I would have taken the slap, waited, and picked the best possible time to make my move. But that would have meant losing, letting him be dominant over me. It was what the Dark Lord couldn't do with the master he wanted to learn from. I see that you have understood perfectly. And so, Mr. Potter, today you are going to learn how to lose. It is evident both that you need this and that you are strong enough to take it. I assure you that your experience will not be so harsh as what I went through, though you may well remember it as the worst 15 minutes of your young life. Professor Quirrell, can we do this some other time? No. You are five days into your Hogwarts education and already this has happened. Today is Friday. Our next defense class is on Wednesday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, we do not have time to wait. Professor Quirrell, if you do anything like what you talked about, it's going to make me angry, and I really would rather not get angry again today. The point is not to avoid getting angry. Anger is natural. You need to learn how to lose even when you are angry, or at least pretend to lose so that you can plan your vengeance, as I did with Mr. Goyle today, unless, of course, any of you think he really is better. I'm not! I know you didn't really lose! Please don't plan any vengeances! Professor Quirrell didn't know about his mysterious dark side. Professor, we really need to talk about this after class. We will, after you learn how to lose. Professor Quirrell, do you really believe that if I don't do this, I might hurt someone? Yes. Then, I'll do it. So, with the full approval of your teacher, and in such a fashion that Snape cannot be blamed for your actions, do any of you wish to show your dominance over the boy who lived? Shove him around, push him to the ground, hear him beg for your mercy. Everyone with your hand raised, you are an absolute idiot. What part of pretending to lose did you not understand? If Harry Potter does become the next Dark Lord, he will hunt you down and kill you after he graduates. I won't. I swear never to take vengeance upon those who helped me learn to lose. I am sorry, Mr. Potter. I realize that you must find this equally annoying whether you intend to become a Dark Lord or not. But those children also had an important life lesson to learn. Would it be acceptable if I awarded you a quarrel point in apology? Make it two. Done. Professor, it is also not my own ambition to become a stupid Dark Lord. You worry that you cannot pretend to lose, Mr. Malfoy? That this flaw which describes Harry Potter also describes you? Surely your father taught you better. I want to be fully as strong as you, Professor Quirrell. I am afraid, Mr. Malfoy, that the arrangements I made for Mr. Potter, involving some older Slytherins who will be told afterward how stupid they were, would not carry over onto you. But it is my professional opinion that you are already very strong. Should I hear that you have failed, as Mr. Potter failed today, I will make the appropriate arrangements and apologize to you and whomever you have hurt. I do not think that will be necessary, however. Professor Quirrell looked over the class. Does anyone else wish to become strong? Some students glanced around nervously. In the end, no one spoke. Draco Malfoy will be one of the generals of your year's armies, should he deign to engage in that after-school activity. And now, Mr. Potter, please come forward. Harry stood on a soft blue mat, such as might be found in a muggle dojo, which Professor Quirrell had laid out upon the floor for when Harry was pushed down. Harry was frightened of what he might do. 
If Professor Quirrell was right about his intent to kill... I will not go for their eyes. I will not go for their eyes. I will not go for their eyes. It would be the end of my life in Hogwarts. I'll be arrested. Potter, meet Peregrine Derrick. He is better than you, and he is about to show you that. I repeat, Potter is not to be really hurt. Any and all accidents will be treated as deliberate. Derek strode forward, and Harry's brain screamed discordantly. He must not run away. He must not fight back. Ask him not to hurt you. Perhaps if he sees that you're pathetic enough, he'll decide that you're boring and go away. There was laughter from the watching older Slytherins. Please, don't hurt me. That didn't sound very sincere. Please, don't hurt me. How in Merlin's name did you manage to make that sound like an insult, Potter? There is only one response you can possibly expect from Mr. Derrick. Derrick stepped forward deliberately and bumped into Harry. You bumped into me, Potter. Apologize. I'm sorry. You don't sound sorry. Derrick pushed him, hard, and Harry fell to the mat on his hands and knees. He was beginning to doubt Professor Quirrell's real motives in teaching him this so-called lesson. A foot rested on Harry's buttocks, and a moment later, Harry was pushed hard to the side, sending him sprawling on his back. All he had to do was say it was over, and report the whole thing to the headmaster's office. That would be the end of this defense professor, and his ill-fated stay at Hogwarts, and... Professor McGonagall would be angry about that. Now, tell him that he's better than you, Potter. You're better than me. Stop! Please stop! Better. That even sounded sincere. It had been. That was the horrible thing, the sickening thing. It had been sincere. Lose. I lose! I like it. Harry had long since passed the point of trying not to cry, and was now just trying not to fall down. What are you, Potter? I lose, sir. I lose. I give up. You win. You're b b better than me. Please stop. Enough. Step away from Mr. Potter. Harry saw the surprised looks on their faces. The chill in his blood, which had been flowing and ebbing, smiled in cold satisfaction. Professor Quirrell talked. There were gasps from the older Slytherins. And I believe the scion of Malfoy has something he wants to explain to you as well. Draco's voice started talking. His voice sounded almost as sharp as Professor Quirrell's. It had acquired the same cadence Draco had used to imitate his father, and it was saying things like, Could have put Slytherin House in jeopardy, and Who knows how many allies in this school alone, and Total lack of awareness, never mind cunning, and Dull thugs, useful for nothing but lackeys. Then Draco stopped talking, and Professor Quirrell told the older Slytherins they were dismissed. No one's to take any revenge on them. That's a request to anyone who considers themselves my friend. I had my lesson to learn. They helped me learn it. They had their lesson to learn too. It's over. If you tell the story, make sure you tell that part too. Harry turned to look at Professor Quirrell. You lost. Harry had lost. There had been moments when the cold anger had faded entirely, replaced by fear, and during those moments he'd begged the older Slytherins and he'd meant it. Not all losing is like this. There are compromises and negotiated surrenders. There are other ways to placate bullies. There is a whole art form to manipulating others by letting them be dominant over you. But first, losing must be thinkable. Will you remember how you lost? Yes. Will you be able to lose? I think so. I think so too. Congratulations, Harry Potter. You win. There was no single source, no first mover. The applause started all at once like a massive thunderclap. Harry couldn't keep the shock from his face. He risked a glance at his classmates and he saw their faces showing not pity but awe. The applause was coming from Ravenclaw and Gryffindor and Hufflepuff and even Slytherin, probably because Draco Malfoy was applauding too. You have just found out that the real world does not always work like your worst nightmares. Yes, if you had been some poor anonymous boy being abused, then they would probably have respected you less afterward, pitied you even as they comforted you from their loftier perches. That is human nature, I'm afraid. 
But you, they already know for a figure of power. And they saw you confront your fear and keep confronting it, even though you could have walked away at any time. Did you think less of me when I told you I had deliberately endured being spat upon? Your extraordinary achievement in my class deserves an extraordinary reward, Harry Potter. Please accept it with my compliments on behalf of my house, and remember from this day forward that not all Slytherins are alike. 51 points to Ravenclaw. Harry felt something wrong about that. Professor McGonagall had been right. There should have been consequences. You couldn't just put everything back the way it was like that. But Harry saw the elated faces in Ravenclaw and knew he couldn't possibly say no. His brain made a suggestion. It was a good suggestion. Harry could not even believe his brain was still keeping him upright, let alone producing good suggestions. Professor Quirrell, you are everything a member of your house should be, and I think you must be just what Salazar Slytherin had in mind when he helped found Hogwarts. I thank you and your house. And I think this calls for three cheers for Slytherin. With me, everyone? Huzzah! Only a few people managed to join in on the first try. Huzzah! This time, most of Ravenclaw was in on it. Huzzah! That was almost all of Ravenclaw, a scattering of Hufflepuffs, and around a quarter of Gryffindor. Most of the Slytherins had expressions of sheer shock. A few were staring at Professor Quirrell in wonder. Blaise Zabini was looking at Harry with a calculating, intrigued expression. Now, believe it or not, we still have half an hour left in this session, and that is enough to introduce the simple shield. Mr. Potter, of course, is going off and taking a well-earned rest. I can... Idiot. Your classmates can teach you afterward, or I'll tutor you privately if that's what it takes. But right now, you're going through the third door from the left in the back of the stage, where you will find a bed, an assortment of exceptionally tasty snacks, and some extremely light reading from the Hogwarts library. Now go. Harry went.